Greetings everyone and welcome back to TNO, the last days of Europe in which we're playing is the Empire of Japan. Right now, we're going to break into some comments immediately, even though it is February 15th, 1969. Uh, so the first comment is, The Dai Li Crisis investigation is a, seems a little bug. There's a very specific set of steps you have to do to finish this, as some of you guys said in the comments from the last video. So, we're going to go ahead and do what someone recommended, and what I also found online. So, we shall investigate the Chongqing Trail. If you want to read about this again, go right ahead. But as that is going on, at the end of the last episode, I said that the focus stream might be bugged. Well, I had to reload the save, and actually I played a little bit ahead of time just to see if like anything would change. And we do have another focus stream to play around with, even though we still have observe and report from Indonesia. So, let's go ahead and... Fruits of the reforms. With the stabilization of Prime Minister Takagi's government, the liberal clique can finally turn their attention towards addressing platforms on which they came into power. Into the diet. The cabinet will need to address the many issues that the Eno administration has failed to solve. Issues such as the economy, the growing social social political divide that will haunt Japan for decades to come, and the problem of the colonies. Fortunately, Admiral Sukichi Takagi has the solutions to all these quandaries. The economy he shall entrust to Yasuhiro Nakasone, a man who believes in radical ways to reorganize the economy. As for the colonies, the admiral shall employ the Nihon Jinron Doctrine, emphasizing Japan's duty as a nurturer and protector of the great, greater East Asian co-prosperity sphere socially. The prime minister shall aim to be flexible in fulfilling his liberal aims. The reformed bureaucrats, Kidoites, and conservatives have had their chance on the stage of Japanese politics. It is time for the liberals' turn, in which our faction's power increases considerably. So, we have done... The Chongqing Trail, our present state. If you already read about the remains of the loyal patriotic army, go right ahead. And we need to choose option one, a relevant focus on the Juntong Corps, but our present state. Takagi sat with his men surrounded in a busy and regal bar with Tokyo's elites. Soft keys of the piano were playing as a general chatter of the room was a low hum. Although visibly at ease, the Prime Minister spoke sternly to his men about a serious, very serious issue. Make no mistake, gentlemen, we've come a very long way. We've practically stomped out corruption from the dark corners of the diet and civil service. And the economy has more or less recovered. Maybe we drink to that tonight. The cabinet sat with the Prime Minister, sipping in glasses of champagne and leaned back in the chair, circle of chairs. Zanjiro blew a puff of his cigarette, and Kido chewed on a small snack provided with his round of drinks. After they clinked the glasses a second time and chuckled, Takagi continued his speech. I hate to say it, though, our work is not over. The students and protesters demand more from us beyond what I'm actually willing to give them. I knew this would blow up in our faces, Nakasona interrupted, scoffing and clearly tipsy from his drinks. I wish they knew how good we're being to them. Takagi looked over at Nakasone with a frown, but eased his intimidation after noticing that he was merry from the champagne. Nakasone wasn't incorrect, Takagi admitted to himself, now sitting in silence amongst his chattering colleagues. What have we unleashed? So, we got the first one done. The second step is to do Chongqing again. So we're going to read this, go right ahead. And, this will, and then pick the other option. And that'll be good. Oh, and we got to choose a focus too. Let's see. The Ninhon Jinron Doctrine. Not bad. Liberalization's Paradox. I would like to go down this path, Nakasone Plan, because he's very good for the economy, or at least better for the economy. So, Nakasone Plan. For many decades now, the paradigms of the Japanese economy has not changed. Government interventionism is in total war. Industrial policy has brought Japan far for what is now a century since the Restoration. However, even the greatest of empires cannot survive without reform, and the same models now bringing us cha charging headlong towards an economic conflict that favors neither innovation nor competition, but complacency. Yasuhiro Nakasone is a man with a plan. Eschewing the traditional way of doing things, he has promised that the Japanese economy will move away from the old model in its place. Nakasone aims to implement a similar system to that in the U.S. and the rest of the Western world by implementing a free market encouraging friendly competition. He aims to pursue rapid growth followed by social reforms. If the people are happy and working, there will be no need for dissent. Uh, most scathing review. In a dark candlelit study, uh, Shidu, Shidzu Kato was typing up her final notes for her next piece. With each punch of the keys, another letter was added to her paragraphs decrying the Takagi government and the Taisei, Yo, Taisei Yoko Sankai for the moderation and restraint and issues she determined were non-negotiable and integral to the freedom of men and women. The Prime Minister received a copy of the article the day it was published, sneering at the mere sight of it. He flicked through the piece, trying to find humor in its ridiculous claims and outrageous accusations. Dripping with irony, the Prime Minister noted that the only reason the, that the public had access to such defamatory literature was because of his recent relaxation of press censorship, to which he scoffed and smirked as he tossed the article to his side. Give them an inch. Oh boy. And so, one of the comments from the last episode asked if Italy's actually in the co-prosperity sphere or not, and it is currently not. I think I've actually seen Italy join the co-prosperity sphere once, but it was in a different campaign when I tried it, tried another campaign, actually, in my own free time. 
uh, which actually is the next campaign after this. But unfortunately, Itty, Itty, Itty is not in our sphere. And I don't know if I'll ever be able to. It's probably just bugged. I'll be honest. It's probably just bugged. So eventually, I might just say decisions dot no checks to get that done to see what, what could happen maybe. So it's it's, it's got to be bugged. It's been a few years since we've actually done that. So we'll see what happens. So. Remains of the Loyal Patriotic Army. If you'd like to read about this again, go right ahead, because we've read it through this quite a bit. So now we must choose option two, launch investigation. And now we're on step three, in which we have to do out on the streets. Oh boy. The Sako, or investigate Sako. And with this one, fate of the American Expeditionary Forces, did all Americans really ban China? All on the streets. Students have flooded the streets, universities, and public spaces in recent days, chanting anti-government messages and waving about placards criticizing Takagi's handling of recent crises. The economic woes have plagued the nation, and limited rights of students have been at the forefront of the complaints as they harass a hentai and other institutions for solutions to their desperate difficulties. Takagi sat in his office overlooking the streets, reading reports of the protests from intelligence services. Law enforcement did their best to contain the protests and led them away from the important buildings, periodically skirmishing with a local brave student who dared challenge the authority of an officer. The situation did not seem to improve for this government, and the rage of the crowds only intensified in the Prime Minister's quiet neglect, and they'll ask for a mile. Yep. Our time for some coffee that we had to keep us nice and warm as we're looking at the Unity Pact, and they're looking pretty good. Opa Kamando Brashish stuff, huh? If you'd like to read about Sako's background again, go right ahead, but we must choose. Uh, let's see. Pick U.S. Contacts. Yeah. Cool. And then we're on step four. The investigation begins. If you'd like to read about that, go right ahead. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And then after this, we have to choose... I'm not sure if this, this is done yet. Let's give it a few days first. The LPA Cornered. Uh, or the Auspicious Jade. So, if you want to read about the LPA Cornered, this can't be real. We think we finally struck something. Go right ahead. Cool. And then the Order of the Auspicious Jade we did it yesterday. So, let's snoop them out. So we want to finish that path until we get basically the purple clue again, even though we already have it. So, all right, so a man with a plan. Our economy is certainly recovering, Prime Minister. Everything seems to be lining up just as we need. Nakasone, Tek Takagi's economic minister, stood across the conference room surrounded by panels of grass and charts presenting his findings to the Prime Minister and the rest of this cabinet. Wielding a pl presentation pointer, he commanded the room's attention to pale or pie charts of revenue diversification, bar graphs of income in each region, and line graphs predicting the growth of the Japanese economy in the next few fiscal years. Waving his hands in front of him while explaining the potential of the Japanese market share, his crooked smile crept across his face, pleased with the recognition he has now achieved. After a moment of small applause ended abruptly by the Prime Minister, Nakasona continued his speech with Takagi's begrudging permission. He cleared his throat and unveiled a new selection of graphs, grinning like a child showing off his new toys. Nakasona announced that his proposition to go the extra mile, praising a free market model used in many Western countries. He brought the attention of the cabinet to, his, to the prospects of the budding market liberalization across the empire. Whilst Takagi sat at the head of the commerce table's room, uh, Overshadowing all members of his cabinet before him, it seemed as if Nakasone had convinced a handful of these men with his preaching to deregulate and privatize state-controlled assets. Takagi knew that he couldn't win every battle, and he thought that perhaps Nakasone had a point. He would show some respect for the minister for the time being, but Takagi's unfriendly stare reminded Nakasone of his place, subordinate to the prime minister. Takagi's technocracy is going to put is going to get put to the test. Four billion, not bad, not bad. Getting access to the archives, just a little bit more. Yeah, that's okay. Because that's the one we did from yesterday. And next up, push for privatization. The first step to Nakasone's plans privatization of any and all unnecessary state institutions. Japan has far too many of these accumulated through economic interventionism. The previous governments have never come close to eradicating the bloat that infests the state, nor they have tried to. As a result, the government is directing funding to areas that do not contribute to the well-being of the people. These extraneous expenses of blood that the nation's funds dry, leaving no money for projects that are actually useful or beneficial. Nakasone's solution is simple. Sell off these money sinks to the corporations that would be make better use of them. By auctioning off these two willing building factors, the state can regain the money invested as well as provide more avenues through which investment can proceed. By reducing the upkeep of these systems and institutions, the government saves money that can be re-entered into the economy through business initiatives. Good, good, good. A grand economic overall. 
The two men sat apart from each other, silent and apprehensive, and separated by a thick wooden desk in the Prime Minister's office. Dagagi sat behind the mighty desk and was still in his chair, staring down at Nakasona with tired eyes. Nakasona, so unfazed by this encounter, reclined in a seat and gazed back at the Prime Minister. Both of the men knew that they were here to discuss, but Dagagi, drained of any same patience, could barely bring himself to face Nakasona's endless proposals. Prime Minister, uh, I know you're tired. We all are. We've come a long way since the crash, and the economy seems to be in a good place. Now, I've, I here have... I have here with me some plans, and I'm sure they're worth re reading. As Nakasona pulled out the fat dossier, the fat, thick dossier, from a suitcase, the Prime Minister sighed and rolled his eyes, clearly trying to keep himself away from the brinks of anger. A seething haze blurred over Takagi's vision as the minutes crept slowly through Nakasona's ramblings. We outlined three grand pillars, privatization, privatization, fiscal responsibility, and export deregulation. We clearly need not to look beyond opinion in the diet and among lobbyists. This is exactly what they want. We bring, we command their support to, for these liberalizations, and it is sure to bring Japan's riches. To shy away from this, well, I don't think we'd last for much longer in the seats we're seeing in now. With the economic developments throughout the empire stabilizing, we are taking this as a green light to Nakasona, the Prime Minister interrupted, visibly irritated, and knowing he must concede. What do you want here? A dull silence followed. Do you really, seriously think I want to hear this right now? Nakasona's gambit begins. Oh, Oh boy and a red herring so this is still about um the daily conference so cool we gain evidence even though oh this is Chong Ching huh cool oh we might have screwed up here maybe oh passive defense round of change is successful we've gained evidence well all right Cool. Let's see what happens. Hey, record's found. Okay, so now we have the purple evidence as well. So that's good so far. Now that we've got the purple evidence, we are in step four, in which we need to do, investigate Chinese intelligence service. If you want to do about that, go right ahead. So we got to get more clues then. This is a very convoluted way to do this. If you want to do about this, go right ahead. Oh, wait. Hold on. No, that's not good. Oh, maybe we screwed up. Maybe not. Hmm. Order of oh, auspicious jade again. Oh boy. Because we need that red evidence. Push for privatization. The new players. Nakasona sat in a dim ro dining room filled with a cigar smoke illuminated by the gloomy yellow light and surrounded by relaxed and sleazy raccoons. These men were the leading figures in Japan's Karatsu firms. The secret agreements fattened their profits by second as their corporate influence began to stretch across the empire. They clinked champagne glasses and grumbled to each other. Slightly snacking on the extravagant refreshments prepared for the occasion, Nakasona, eager to begin his consultation, stood up from his seat and clinked on the glass to gather the room's attention. Gentlemen, our government has gone forward with the plans of free air choked up economy. Deregulation, privatization... Privatization, you've heard all before, and now it's happening. It continued with his speech and his pre preach of economic reform. The businessman's grins grew hungrier. It was only a matter of time before vicious yet immediate, immensely profitable competition could begin. The slouch men sat forward with their attention firmly commanded by the bright and beautiful words of the Nakasona. Their eyes sparkled and glistened, looking like piranhas ready to dart at any moment. By the end of the address, the men applauded Nakasona with a passion like no other. Though they appeared to support the movement of the government, and even with some getting to shake up Nakasona's hand and chuckle, and the school they craved only one thing, the sooner their deregulation came, the sooner they could sink their teeth into each other's profits. There was an odd shift in, of control in the area. The up, now upright tycoons mingled as experts in the fields, as enemies in the public, but as allies at least for now. Nakasona felt a sense of achievement as he had the support of these men, but suddenly and frighteningly, in that gloomy amber room, he felt outnumbered. So far, so good. So what we're going to do, even if I screw up here, or the game screws up, or bugs out, whatever, we're going to keep going on. However, once this... Maybe halfway through this video, maybe at the end, and maybe I'll do stuff off screen to make sure that we can actually get the daily thing done, maybe. So we'll see what happens. Let's go responsibility. Show us Steelworks on profitability. Why not? Show us Steelworks, built in 1918 and named after the Emperor as a steel mill located in Manchukuo. By the time of the Sino Japanese War, it was one of the most vital industry centers not only of the Empire but of the world. Time has not been kind to it, however. With the decline in military spending, it has become unprofitable, a burden to the state and people alike. The previous governments have only maintained it out of respect to the past, but even that time has driven deep cuts into the nation's revenue. As part of the large-scale private privatization efforts, Nakasone had personally promised Takagi that through the use of Takagi's influence in the Navy, he could show that the show of steel is not only privatized, but it also offered itself up for privatization. Takagi has, as is usual, reluctantly agreed. Nice. Hey, minus 63, not bad. Roundup and Chengdu successful on day's work. Okay, we got the yellow evidence again. The old families. Nakasone anxiously stood at present uh, in the front of a boardroom table, as, at which delegates from the Mutsi, Mitsubishi, and Tsutimo, Tsutitomo, 
Sutitomo. Sumitomo. Hmm. Looked down with steely boredom. He trembled as if a schoolboy preparing to give a speech in front of the class had taken a lot of effort to wrangle together the big four or the big three miraculously to hear out the proposal. The delegates were, to put it lightly, ancient. The old men, veterans of decades of corporate struggle and zaibatsu antics, fiddled with their pants and straightened their papers as Nakasone coughed to prepare his voice. Gentlemen, we sit here today to discuss the possibilities presented to the free market by the deregulation and the privatization policies of Sochi Takaki's government. We are in the administration. Look to the private sector as the next great area of reform. If we are to maintain the prosperity and growth of Japan and the Dai Tao Kaioi Ken. Nakasone continued as smartly as ever, hoping to curry favor with these times of industry. He flew through this pre-prepared presentation until suddenly the remote clicker stopped working. He coughed again and laughed nervously as the beads of sweat rolled off his face. Well, the snapping turtles at last spoke up. I think I speak for all of us when I say that the proposal is indeed, indeed intriguing, but it is clear you have no understanding of how much such an operation should be completed and what goals should be. You treat economic reform like a boy wielding his father's gun. We would not like to conduct business with a partner who operates in ignorance of the realities of the market. Good day. The old men shoved their papers into their suitcases and promptly shuffled out. Only one delegate, that of Sumitomo, uh, remained. Sumitomo's delegate walked up to Nakasona, who was at la the last moment sulking in place, put his hand on Nakasona's shoulder. Listen, just between you and me, I hate these old guys. Let me get Sumitomo in on your deal, alright? The only future they see is one of absolute domination, but I think we both know the path Japan is going down. There's wisdom in these old families yet. Cool. Maybe I did this a little bit too fast for the things here. The Devil in the Northwest. Oh, Takagi once again found himself staring down Nakasone as he ha was half demanded, half begged for the fulfillment of an yet another one of his proposals. This was getting ridiculous. They sat in the dining car of a transport train transporting them to one of Takagi's media channels for Takagi would see to it that his public relations didn't deteriorate following the recent changes. This was supposed to be a break where they could relax and eat expensive appetizers, but as with all things, Nakasone transformed it into work. He, he was kept bringing up his agreements with the Zaibatsus and Karetsus and the four pillars of the free market and so forth. Nakasone would never be satisfied. Takagi, listen. Sumitomo and all the Karatsus have agreed to our proposal. The market is waiting for us to fulfill our end of the deal. Reforming Japan necessitates the expansion and growth of the free market. And even if, uh, and if even if you don't agree with that liberalization of the economy is a necessity, you must admit that making deals and then dropping them isn't going to bode well for political relationships. You, Takagi states as he points his bony finger towards Nakasona, you made the deals, not me. You were the one who pushed me into this corner. I don't have time to clean up the messes from your personal adventures, Nakasona. Takagi breathes in and restrains his behavior. Nakasona, I am simply concerned with the policies that you're driving or diving headfirst into. Look at Manchuko. Shuo Steelworks and Mantetsu hold absolute domination over the area, and the living conditions are awful and will stay awful. All I am saying is that you are blindly trusting these corporations out of dedication to the free market, and oh, well, sure, but very naive. That is why we must hurry to liberalize the market. As soon as competition can be introduced, we can prevent the rise of monopolistic enterprises like the likes, the likes in Manchuko. Do you follow me, Takagi? Nakagi sat in silence, looking over the rolling landscape of the Japanese countryside. I'm going to regret this, but you may, Nakasone, keep going forward with your proposal. Now, may we finally order a meal, introduce the will, and the way will follow. <clears throat> my apologies about my voice. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. And let's get through another focus as well. Hopefully soon. Just, mm, I, we might screw that one up, maybe, maybe not. We could try it again, but if not, whatever. Cool. Bright smiles and bloody hands. While well, the workers of the Shua Steelworks courtyard witness was a military march, a temporary occupation authority acting on no order of the law or mandate of the military. A procession of the Navy's men marched towards Shua Steelworks headquarters, uh, disarming or strong arming all, all guards positioned in the facility. The procession, led by a smiling gentleman in business attire, forcefully entered the headquarters and marched to the office of the head of the facility, where the head operator did not assist was at Yasuhiro Nakasona, the Minister of Finance who commanded the op occupation. As nonchal nonchalantly as humanly possible, Nakasona entered the office of the head operator and began giving out orders. The whole, whole operation was unapologetic thuggery, acting under the guise of administrative formality. Hello, my name is Yasuhiro Nakasona. I expect you to be the head of this facility. I am acting on behalf of a government commission. The goal of which I is to is the prosperity and growth of our nation's free market and entrepreneurial systems or enterprises. I come to you with a proposal. I'm humbly asking you and the body you work for to consider the privatization of your facilities. With the word privatization, the Navy's men pulled out of their pistols and a bundle of papers was then laid on the head operator's desk. The bundle cont contained 
Within a series of forged entries and reports which attested to the incompetence of the administration of the steelworks, Nakasone then turned to the office window. Looking over the bursts of smog, the heat blasting from the furnaces, the smashing of metal, and the roaring machines, Nakasone felt satisfaction, the might of industry, the delight of mass production. The economist dream, looking back to the Navy's men, he nodded at his head. They shot into the ceiling of the office, which was then followed with the cracking of gunshots across the facility. The head operator was agape with terror and confusion. Nakasone turned to leave, remarking, This needs to be done, sir. I hope you can understand. The future's upon us, and I only want to make our transition easier. There will be no last hurdle. Good, good, good. Fiscal responsibility. It is beyond question that the Japanese nation cares for its citizens. Through myriad programs and initiatives, it has striven to close the gap between the poor and the rich, the sick and healthy, the jobless and employed. However, many of these programs, if not most of them, go to waste. It is Nakasona's opinion that the past governments have squandered too much for far too little game. As a result, the government enters debt for those who are only a drain in society. Fiscal responsibility shall be the key word of Prime Minister Kakagi's economic policy. The citizens of Japan pay their taxes every year, and therefore, the government should answer to them and them only. The government shall be cut, cut, cut until it reaches a baseline that is economically sustainable. Only the necessities shall be kept. <clears throat> Neither Nakasone nor the cabinet condone indolence or laziness. There's no such thing as a free lunch in the admirals of Japan. Very cool. So we did the investigate Chinese intelligence service again, so... If we screwed it up, we screwed it up, and like I said, I'll fix things off screen. Oh, seven billion! I gotta do that. I've gotta cut that down. We're doing better here. I'll, I'm loving this. Uh, I love ref good reforms. Sometimes when you do reforms, they can do really, really well. Other times when you do reforms, sometimes they might not do super, super well. But you know what? Whatever. We don't have a lot of war support. That's okay. It is 69. So let's see. We got all that done. That's a little bit ahead of time. Industry. We can't do anything here yet. We can't do anything here yet because it's still 69. We did. We finished our air doctrine, which is great. This stuff is all good. Uh, let's get the early spy plane because we can. Because why not? So fiscal responsibility. Thank you very much. And we'll do curving government spending. The priority of every government, in Nakasone's view, is responsibility towards the taxes paid to it. The government of Japan spends much. These days, it must divide itself amongst its defenses, the welfare of its people, economic development, and many, many other things. The fact that it has driven itself into debt to maintain the high standards of living for the average Japanese citizen speaks to the dedication to the duty and service of its citizenry, or to its citizenry. However, governments do not function on gratitude alone. The present state of the government's spending is unsustainable, and that much is clear. Continuing the trend of fiscal responsibility that Nakasone has set, the government shall again cut extra extraneous expenses and attempts to balance the national budget. No programs for the lazy, indolent, or outcasts. No more throwing money at our overbloated army. The government shall ensure that money goes to the right recipients and fiscal and responsible citizens. Good. The fiscal position. Oh. Ooh. Always false. Oh, we don't. Need, we can't even do that. Okay, so whatever. The fiscal position, then. Here he was again. At was always again and again and again. This was his... Sisyphean task, his personal hell. Life was only an interlude between these moments, it seemed. Takagi stuck in his desk, listened to another of one of Nakasuna's proposals. Various reports, statistics, graphs, and whatnot were scattered all over the office. Takagi questioned Nakasuna's mental integrity. Did Nakasuna really think he was going to look over all his debt, or did he just want a lot of random statistics to make his argument sound more convincing? Wait, was he doing that the entire time? Please... Takagi played attention, essentially. The point of this proposal is a reduction in government spending and blow it across the board. The smaller the government is, the less the next government will be able to undo our reforms, and the less the next government will be able to interfere with the free market. Takagi truly wondered if Nakasone dreamed of the words free market while sleeping. How many times had those words pierced his ears and bur burrowed into his skull? Now, key to this proposal is cutting the budget of the army. It is no secret that the army is a reactionary organization that would only undo our reforms if given the chance. Not to mention that the army is consuming unimaginable proportions of our budget already, and as such, we could do with trimming the fat. Government subsidies, too, must be cut, or at the very least, the subsidies to all loyal firms to avoid the publicity hit, I suggest we do behind scenes. Disguising the cuts as business actions taken on behalf of bad projections, of course, we should also consider cutting Takagi had heard enough. If this proposal would undermine the army's influence and satisfy Nakasone's lust for a free mar freer market, then it already had more upsides than whatever downsides the rest of the proposal could contain. All right, Nakasona, you may move forward with your proposal, although ultimately it isn't my decision whether or not this proposal will pass into law. Do keep that in mind. I won't fight your battles for you. You're going to be the one to dance this Fandango. This time around, Nakasona, I want to welcome you to the bloodiest battlefield our nation has to offer. Sir, did you just say Fandango? You know what I like about this? Oh, we can't do this anyways, but I'll tell you just a little bit what I think about this. Uh, we can do that one. Stability. I'm going to get more war support. Ooh, that's not bad, but that are... Ooh. Higher education? Ooh, yeah. Oh, yeah, let's do that one. The Nin Hon Jin Jinron Doctrine. Our government, faced with the challenges of a modern Japan, has developed a, fast, a vast and sophisticated program of uh, actively across the co-prosperity sphere to build up influence throughout Asia. Broadly, the strategy is two prongs. First, to develop the technological and 
a strategic expertise needed for Japan to maintain its position as a first-ranked industrial and military power, second to assert Japanese economic and cultural leadership around the world, cementing its position as a serious rival to the German and American regimes. Takagi names these the Ninhon Jinran Doctrine as an expression of Japan's unique cultural and political position in the world, championing this key strategy as a path to inter international primacy and prestige. Nice. And got more research. Cool. That's done. That's all done. I always, I never do AF, IFVs because I don't think they're really worth it. But that's just me. Please give me one moment because my cat wants to leave the room. Yeah, buddy. My apologies. With whom shall I dance? Maybe you? Let's go dancing. Nakasone descended into the chamber of the House of Representatives alone for the first time in his career as a civil servant and politician. It was at last. Time to present his comprehensive program to cut the blow. The army would suffer under the proposal, so he expected to experience resistance from the army sympathizers, especially Ikeda's conservative faction and the so-called reform bureaucrats. The whole die was not to be trusted for any longer than it took for the cash in their pockets to burn up. He had a plan, however. A plan to rock the lower house to wield his charm and charisma to command a majority. Takagi would see that he could do it, but he was capable, and that he could master the blood Court. Stepping onto the central platform's speaking platform, Nakasona unleashed his smile as bright as he could muster it. Hello, I'm Yasuhiro Nakasona. For the remainder of the session, I will be speaking on behalf of the Sochi, uh, Sokichi Takaki government. I've called upon the House of Representatives to discuss the merits and ultimately prove or deny a budgetary reform which will, as is included in the folders in front of all of you, cut unnecessary bloat throughout the entire government structure. The HOR erupted. The reform bureaucrats exploded at the premise of weakening the government and the army especially. In order to counteract the jeers and boos of the reform bureaucrats, <clears throat> Takagi's liberal faction cheered Nakasona on. The Kidoites waited to see what would happen while the independents crumbled into factions. K Ikeda's conservatives, the kingmakers, waited for Ikeda himself to make a decision. Following the wait, Ikeda descended the steps in order to meet with Nakasona. Upon reaching the speaking platform, Ikeda slung his hand on Nakasona's shoulder and smiled. The House of Representatives transformed into pandemonium on Earth, but eventually the applause beat out the screams of the decriers. A surprise to be sure, but it seemed that the conservatives too disliked the unsustainable state of the budget. All was going to plan. I will make you proud, Takagi. Oh man, a surprise to be sure, but a welcome one. Awesome. Budget, 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 budget. My goal is to get at least below 600 billion by the time this campaign ends. So, that seems like a good goal to have. A partner arrives. The foreign bureaucrats, as a mob, descended to meet Nakasona face to face. In order to protect Nakasona, the liberals followed. The conservatives and the like-minded independents came down too, if only to prevent the breakout of a fight. The Kidoites, for their part, sat still and waited for their developments. Out of the crowd of reform bureaucrats, Nakasona witnessed a figure emerging to challenge his position on the speaking platform with dead eyes and a leathery, bloated custard sack of a bottle of a bottle cap of a neck. He wore colorless business attire and expressed all emotion and the boundaries of bureaucratic decorum. Nobusuki Kishi, the leader of the reformed bureaucrats, was here to face the new blood. Nakasona readied himself and in a typical fashion entered the conversation in verse. Nobusuke Kishi, I expect you to present a list of reasonable complaints against my proposal, but let's be honest, you're going to act like I spat on the emperor's shoes for merely suggesting the budget to be reformed. Kishi got as close as he could to Nakasona. He stared forward, ignoring Nakasona's comments. Do not act like I do not know what you're doing. You think you can just walk up and sway the diet by preaching nothing but blind ideology? You have the disposition of an arrogant schoolboy. You need someone to check your ever expanding ego, and I'd all be but too glad to rip apart your, this proposal, your list of fever dreams, in front of the crowds and cameras. Run off, boy, before you reveal to the nation your idiocy. The crowd undulated with excitement, rage, and rancor. Screams bursted from across the mob. Nakasona, taken aback, retreated from the speaking platform. He didn't look back to the lower house, and so leaving, leaving the House of Representatives as quietly as he entered. The plan didn't work, and only Takagi knew what to do now. One step forward, two steps back, time for coffee. Takagi, I <clears throat> need your help. That man, Kishi, he got to me. I exposed myself, and I can't pick up the pieces. The proposal is never going to make it through a vote. Takagi, surely you can sympathize. I know what you said, but my mouth is acting before my mind. I need you, Takagi, if I'm ever going to get out of this mess. Takagi looked up from his papers and breathed in, the disappointment palpable. If you knew what I said, why did you come to ask me, Nakasona? Nakasona? I, I meant it. You can't keep doing this, launching into proposals and projects of your own initiative, expecting me to bear the effects of your decisions. I'm done with this game, Nakasona. I'm finished. <clears throat> Nakasona, step forward, his shadow now looming over Takagi. I wouldn't be doing this alone if you ever actually listened to me. You can't keep ignoring the future, Takagi. Our economy grows more and more interconnected with us within the sphere and beyond the day. And by the day, and yet I'm the only one to see to it and to prepare for us that inevitability. We're going to be destroyed if we don't do anything or something. I'm begging you, Takagi. Our nation needs this. I need this. Takagi stood up from his desk, towering over Nakasona. Who do you think I am, Nakasona? Your puppet? Your tool? This is my premiership at stake. Threatening businesses, dealing with the Zaibatsus and Kuretsus, risking everything on the market. I'm the one who has to cover for your antics, for the gambles you take. Days of speeches, hours on cameras, just because of you. You, Nakasona. I can't keep killing myself over a child who thinks he's a politician. 
Nakasone was stunned. Takagi, Takagi, the man he looked up to. The man who always knew what to do. Using the same lines that, that dude, Kishi. Nakasone backed away, staring at the carpet. Upon reaching the hallway, Kido passed him. He put his hand on Nakasone's shoulder and whispered, I'm going to see what I can do. You go out there and rouse su support. Cover your emotions and put on a smile. You want this proposal to pass? Go out and fight for it. But what do I really want? Oh boy. Yeah, what do you really want? Drums beat and trumpets sing. Don't lose it. Cover your emotions. You're a politician and businessman now. You're an economist and the minister of finance. It doesn't matter what he thinks. You're a favorite of the liberal faction. You've got support for the independence and keto. The conservatives will. Who knows? Take Kishi down. That's all you must do. Calm down. Do not panic and turn the handle. Nakasone swung open the doors. The representatives of the lower house, all of them, sat staring in silence. Nakasone made his way down towards the central speaking platform. Kishi and his cronies were already waiting there as Kishi gave a speech in opposition to the proposal. Nakasone could not contain his fury, his better resentment. Upon seeing Nakasone, Kishi remarked, Here we see. Nakasone returns. I expect he will want to give a few words. Sadly, he already was given the opportunity to give a speech and relinquished it. Nakasone ignored Kishi and moved on to meet him in the speaking platform. My dear friend, Nak Nobusuke Kishi, as unfortunately as in many other things, overestimated the poignance of his words and the skill inherent to him. My proposal would not in any dramatic effect weaken our military capabilities or the effectiveness of our government. The goal is to cut blow. If you have a meal with a rotten ingredient, removing the ingredient will not weaken the quality of the meal, only improve it. Kishi whispered to Nakasone, You remain a child in all things, even your metaphors speak of immaturity. Nakasone stared forward. Emotions bubbled from within, but through mental fortitude, he restrained himself. You know, behind your facade, I would bet you envy youth. In fact, I know you do. Suddenly, a representative ran into the chamber, shouting for the lower house's attention. The nobles had spoken out in favor of the proposal. All conversations were broken by fierce applause, originating from the liberal faction. Members of the other factions took this opportunity to reconsider their position in the wake of this unexpected news. My goodness, Keto. Let us finish this. And we can't do that one yet. So, I want to go over here to get this. Since it has higher spending... Or higher education, it costs more, but that's going to be worth it. The Japanese duty. As a shining light of liberation, liberation across Asia and the leading beacon of resistance against Western aggression, it's our duty to our mighty and just empire to lift our Asian brothers out of poverty and squalor. Just as our great nation modernized in all fields of the Maoji era, we must bring a similar enlightenment to our brother nations across the sphere so that they may also touch greatness. It is the fate of the empire of Japan that to be at the helm of this modern Asian renaissance and to bear witness to the ascension of the East Asia to international acclaim. Very, very good. We only have 387 factories, though. Cool. Let's finish this. And that's a proposal passed. The budget was formed along Nakasone's lines. Nakasone got the chance to smile in front of the press, standing next to Kido and other members of the liberal faction. He could claim on national TV and then on the newspapers that this was his achievement, a great place of legislative work that he and Kido could claim for themselves, but it didn't satisfy him. It wasn't because of Kido's sharing the victory, no. It wasn't because he didn't accomplish what he set out to do when he first began working on his projects and proposals. Takagi was cleaning up the papers on his desk and turning out the dikes in his office when Nakasone entered. This time, it wouldn't be about work. Takagi, I'd like to apologize for my behavior earlier on. It was not becoming of an advisor to the Prime Minister. I apologize for making you suffer for so long because of my naivety na naivety, and my overbearing commitments. My com commitments and my lack of adherence to authority and law and Takagi took it upon himself to embrace Nakasona the way of the father of my com comfort son. Nakasona, I am sorry for what I did. For what I said, you were right. I've never listened to you, but not, not only have I ignored what you were saying, but even once I listened to you, I misinterpreted or neglected to think about what you truly mean. Thinking about it, it all seems so obvious. I am proud of you, Nakasona. On to a new path for Japan. There we go. Oh, we get it done immediately. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. All right, how are we doing here? We're building up more land, which is cool and all, but factories? No? Okay, so let's get through one more focus, and then we'll try something else. We got a lot of political power. How is the GUI? We got weak, we're, but we're high here, which is not bad. Global training centers. Oh, ooh. Eastern Russia is set on fire right now. Cool, the Japanese duty. So then we could do this, which would be the Nakasona plan. Let's go and get education and sphere. For the co-prosperity sphere to be remain a powerful competitor against our rivals across the globe, the nations under Japan's benevolent watch must be elevated to form a cohesive and fraternal community of peoples. So therefore, we have determined that educational standards across Asia must be improved and that we shall focus on the enlightenment of the future generations from Naji. Excuse me, from Nanjing to Rangoon, with new educational boards, improved teaching methods, and a drive for higher, edu higher levels of funding for education across the sphere, we expect it to initiate an entire generation of skilled professionals with a schooling that will raise the community to new heights. Well, with that, I will be right back. All right, everyone, sorry about that, but I did try to do the Dai Li Crisis investigation off screen, and it's completely bugged. So, unfortunately, we will not be able to complete this event because, well, it is completely bugged as we saw earlier, because for some reason, it, whenever we clicked on investigate the Chinese intelligence service, it always goes back to investigate the Chongqing trial. So, unfortunately, it is not 
possible to complete that, at least for this campaign, just because it's bugged, which is really stupid. But regardless, we have Education and Sphere that we're doing it like before we left off, and we can also do it moving forward. So let's see what happens. Um, we can try it again. We're trying it again, but it, it's not going to work. Formation of the Suck Intern, the Return of the Reds. Cool. Let's see. We don't have a lot of money. Uh, let's go ahead and cut down. Ooh, actually, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So really six some. We're not going to cut construction spending anymore. We could slash civilian spending, actually. Well, hmm. We could try it. That doesn't help us that much, though. Not really that much. So, that, one, two, three, four, five, almost six. Almost six. Oh, the Americans request taking, request talks on the treaty ports. <clears throat> the, the official missive landed softly in the Prime Minister's desk, completely out of proportion with the weight of its contents. The office was silent for a few short moments as the Prime Minister Tsukichi Takagi and the Foreign Minister considered the magnitude of what was occurring. It's finally come, hasn't it, the Prime Minister Tsukichi Tuk Takagi ventured. The Americans have finally worked up the nerve to ask for the treaty ports. Ever since Eisenhower tore up the Akagi Accords, we've had to know that this would come someday. The Foreign Minister sighed, the prob Americans probably aren't serious, ser seriously considering we're going to war for the ports, but... <clears throat> Takagi nodded somberly. Two years after the victory of the Pacific, the ports were rapidly becoming more trouble than they were worth as Japan faced new challenges from every corner. If Japan could walk away from the negotiations with tangible guarantees, open trade, oil provisions, or an enforceable promise to formally recognize Japan's suzerainty over the sphere, then what were two ports really? It would, kind of, it would take every ounce of political and diplomatic capital to keep as any deal as favorable to Japan as possible, even if they gave way on certain issues or items to claim, gain temporary advantage to be used later, and if they failed, the Prime Minister's days would surely be numbered. Was this meeting in Hawaii? Cool. So we want to invest as much political power as possible. Invest a meeting in Hawaii. A meeting in Hawaii. And now we shall do... We did that, so we, now things cost more. But we got more political power and more change in poverty and research and stuff like that. It's not bad. Ooh. Uh, Middle East beckons. Cool. And soft victory. Eh. Let's do moving forward. Yosuo Hiro Nakasone's plan to reshape the Japanese economy not ju has just begun. But the nation can already see its effects. Through austerity and privatization has not have not been taken well by certain groups. At points, including her own prime minister, overall reception to changes has been at the very best. Or at the very least, not as bad as it could be. The government is well on its way to achieve budget balance for the first time in decades with its surplus funds. The government can now look forward to implementing further economic reforms. The decisions of prime ministers, however, to continue the Nakasone's erratic and hyperactive pace of economic liberalization, or to moderate his policy stance and calm down the minister of finance before things get out of control. Being as Takagi's relationship with Nakasone has become ever more personal, no one knows which way he'll end up drifting. We'll see what happens. Minus 40, but that's not too bad, especially with education spending more and more and more. But that's not too bad. That's really not too bad. And the debt is okay as well. Not awful. Cool. The Americans have a counteroffer. Are they being serious? Prime Minister Tsukichi Takagi asks his foreign minister. The Americans are asking us for a favor, and yet they want to quibble over holding the summit on their ships. The foreign minister replied hesitantly. The Americans are being stubborn, but they might have their own concerns about how the negotiations play back home. If we did them a favor here, they might be willing to listen to us later. Prime Minister Tsukichi Takagi sighed. We have no pri privacy on one of their ships, but the favor is a favor. They fell silent for a moment. What about Mexico? It's a neutral ground. We all have diplomatic missions there. It's only possible. It's the only option that's reasonable for everyone. We gain political power. Both Mexico City. I'm going to propose it. Why not? Oh, we lost command power. Oh, we actually lose stuff every day. From the Daily Conspiracy. That is such garbage. Such garbage that we can't get rid of it. The summit is set. The Americans set over their agreement on the summit location. The, the foreign minister said, watching his prime minister... Uh, Takagi read the Kamunikyu. It's about time, Takagi stated. None of us have the time to be playing games over time and place. The Prime Minister nodded hesitantly. Can't quite believe we're still just going to be doing this, giving up what we won in the war just like this. The Prime Minister grimaced before composing himself. It's not just you, believe me. Well, all we've ever wanted from America are two things, oil and markets. If we give the ports back, uh, giving the ports back guarantees us those things will have, it'll have been worth it. Always keep your eyes on the prize. Pretty much. Now let's go invest some GDP a little bit more. Hey, the growth is minus 2.6% instead of 2.9. Could be worth a terrible offer. Our diplomats were taken by surprise when the Americans decided to offer us only a small amount of oil. This insignificant amount won't be able to solve our oil crisis. It's going to take a lot more from the Americans if we're going to pr properly fix our economy. Many among us have wondered whether or not the Americans are giving us the respect we deserve when they decided to make that ridiculous proposal. Prime Minister, there are three options on the table right now. We can take the blow to our reputation and accept their current offer, realizing it'll do little to help our situation. We can barter with the Americans in order to receive more moderate amount of oil. Finally, we can demand Americans give us a large amount of oil we rightfully deserve. I'm going to speak of our demand the greatest amount of oil possible. Of course, the talks begin, which is good, and we'll do this as well. Ship stuff. Resume battleship development, because why not? We love battleships. Armored department, moving forward, don't mind if we do. 
Wiretapping, don't mind if we do as well. A moderate path. More GDP growth. I like that. Actually, what does the Nakasona plan do for us? Die of the Conspiracy, which is just... I don't know why it's even here. Why is it even in the game if it's not even finished yet? Hmm. STEM, not bad for research research facilities, monthly gains, as well as academic base. Poverty goes up, growth gets a little higher up. The triumph of moderation, the greedy GDP growth increased by a lot. Business friendly, even more GDP growth. Low taxation, which will hurt us. Poverty rate slowly begins to improve, begins to improve slowly. Untapped markets, beating the heart of the empire, or the sphere. Ooh. You know what? We've been pretty moderate throughout. It'd probably be better to go down the moderate path. But let's go business, business for the economy. After a heartfelt conversation, Takagi and Nakasone have come up to an agreement concerning the continuation of Nakasone's economic reform policies. At last, Takagi has listened to Nakasone's reasoning and has thus come to share the same view. Japan is hurtling towards catastrophe. Japan cannot survive the ever growing economic connectedness of the modern world if it has used the old systems built on domination and conquest. Together, Takagi and Nakasone have agreed to further the collective vision of a free market, or a freer market, and cut down government. No longer will Nakasone blindly pursue his dreams of liberalization, shooting programs and proposals into the dark. The free market will be achieved, but only through collaboration and teamwork. The future is upon us, and we walk forward hand in hand. Oh god, let's see what happens. Hopefully the Americans don't do anything stupid either. A complete success. The trade deal between the U.S. and Empire of Japan is being finalized days after a proposal and communication. It seems like both parties are getting the resources they really need. The U.S. will have its ports in San Francisco and L.A. returned without conflict, and the Empire of Japan will be given an oil grant that will help us solve the widespread shortage throughout the sphere. The President and Prime Minister of the U.S. and Japan, respectively, shook hands on the deal just moments ago. No matter what, both parties hope that these negotiations will better relations between the two global superpowers. <clears throat> Workers in both California and the Japanese at home miles rejoice as the nation announced the completion of the deal. Through the, though the trade deal is completed, the diplomats of the U.S. and Japan still have work to do. Talks are supposed to carry on in the next few days, but one thing is for certain. There will be a peaceful end to these important negotiations. The negotiations worked. Well, we'll see what happens. <laughs> we will see what happens. What do we have over here? Oh, no, also, bring the battle to Egypt. Oh, also, I did, off-screen, I did do the uh, thing that get a diplomat to the Italian Empire. So, bring the battle to Egypt. Um, oh, okay, why not? Honolulu Accords. Approaching the table. One of the biggest obstacles faced by our traders and industries is our lack of access to markets in the North and South America. This is caused by our embargo by the USA and the prospect of lifting this embargo is the greatest or the biggest economic prize up for negotiation. Our negotiators are asking us to lay out our position to start the talks. Firstly, we would ask simply for the embargo to be lifted. This would ensure it's the most important prize, market access, and allow us to quickly move on to other parts of the treaty. Many in our cabinets, however, believe that a mutual lift favors the Americans too much and are pushing to detach or at attach trade conditions to the deal. These conditions will provide for mutual reduction of several tariffs in areas beneficial to Japan, ensuring us more favorable trade terms but not go down well with the Americans. Thirdly, there are some who think we are offering a deal too cheaply, inviting further bullying attempts by the Americans in the future. This outspoken group demands we attach a hefty price tag to the transfer of the treaty ports and make this a condition to resume trade. Most other fear trying these tying this issue together could jeopardize finding an agreement on either one. Perhaps a trade agreement? They will pay us for the ports or there will be no trade. Let's just go with the trade agreement. Something simple, right? Something simple. Did anybody click on this earlier? They didn't even do anything, so. They've invested 75 political power, huh? Nobody's currently in the lead, eh? A second attempt. Our offer to resume trade in exchange for concessions on tariffs has been declined by American representatives. He states that a resumption of trade should be considered an opportunity to rebuild links between our countries, not to exact petty conditions, and that it will happily mutually without conditions or not at all. While it seems in effect on surface that we have a choice between a concession-free deal or no deal at all, some of our advisors are convinced that Americans are bluffing and that we could get both trade resumption and conditions we want if we call their bluff. How should we proceed? If we do this one, we get an insistent fool. They're bluffing, insist on conditions. We can't risk losing the deal? No. We're, we're going to go all in. We're going to invest all the political power we have because i got nothing else to do with it. We could do stuff in the, the diet, but yeah. And there goes Yemen. Civil war erupts in Yemen. Good luck, guys. Good luck. Smiles all around. It appears an end is in sight. Hey! For the trade embargo between the world's greatest economies. Lead negotiators from ongoing summit between Japan and the USA made an announcement this morning that a deal will resume trade between their countries has been agreed in principle. To be signed later today on both sides of the Pacific, great hopes are being placed on the economic benefits of the deal and businesses are scrambling to take advantage of the new goods and markets on offer. It seems the world is on one step closer to a thawing in relations between the US and Japan. Next up, supply side, fiscal policies. Ooh, let's go and get down this side because... This, is, this kind of hurts our income, so. Our nation's businesses have, since time immemorial, pleaded with the government to ease our 
These back our chokehold and foreign trade is a crime that our citizens suffer from lost opportunities and unjust dues because of government meddling, which has for centuries held back the expansion of the free market and punished entrepreneurs for their enterprise. Nakasona, champion of the free market, is a witness of 300-year tragedy and seeks to correct it. Takagi, too, has recognized the necessity of easing back trade restrictions, if not enthusiastically as Nakasona. No matter the disagreements, they believe each other to come to a mutually satisfactory compromise. Still not bad, still not bad. Hey! GDP growth is slightly better. Now it's only minus 2.2%, which is good, good, good. It is still 69. Oh, wow. Wow, people are really killing each other now. Better APCs, because we can. And not bad. Let's come over here and do this. Symmetry anti-air. How are we doing on this? Not great, not great. Ooh. I guess I didn't put this on here yet. That's not good. We can actually use more military factories now. Go and do that. That's fine. The American Proposal. It's time to move on to the third and last issue for negotiation, the, the turn of the treaty ports of the USA. The American delegations opened up the negotiations by sending a proposal for the port transfer to be accompanied by mutual demilitarization. They pledged to keep the return ports exclusively civilian, but when asked, but we but ask when we demilitarize Hawaii in return. With the missile crisis in recent memory, they claim our forces on the island chain simply imply a threat to the country which must be removed for normal relations to resume. Agreeing to this proposal will accomplish our main objectives of offloading the diplomatically burdensome ports and improving relations with the USA. According to advisors, our power is far from balanced. The docks in Hawaii are vital for our operational capacity in the eastern Pacific. Losing them will force us to choose between reduced operational space, which will surely anger our admirals, or constructing new docks on different islands, which will be expensive. The Americans have already more than replaced the dock, dock capacity they lost when we occupied the ports and no need of, of them for their navies. Someone in our delegation pointed out that while this particular clause may be unbalanced, we risk losing our gains in the earlier clauses. Should we push Americans too hard on the issue? Are we willing to negotiate over that base? Ports will be demilitarized, not Hawaii. Let's see what happens. Ooh, they might not agree to that, though. We just want to have favorable outcomes for Japan, don't we? We drive a hard bargain. We've invested more than them. Current PP pool is 65. Oman declared war on Oman. Oh man. Insurrection Oman. Good thing I don't really care about it right now. Come on, Americans. Come on. Japan's currently in the lead. What do you offer up? Well, we're eating, easing regulations and untapped market. Looking across Asia, across the Eurasian steep in the Gobi Desert, across in the Tibetan Plateau and the Hindustan Plain, there's a land of immense wealth that our influence has yet to penetrate. The Middle East, a land of deserts and river valleys and overflows with the fuel of empires. Oil. We, much like the rest of the world, are dependent on Italy to keep our military running and our nation standing, but if we could get a foot in the Middle Eastern boat, we could save ourselves millions of dollars in future payments to Italy and get a taste of the Middle East's black gold. It is Nakasona's opinion that no time can be spared in this matter. Either we get a chance to dig into the great Middle Eastern cake, or Germany and Italy, America will beat us to it. Prepare the contracts, or contacts, and ready the fleet, and the future awaits in Muscat, Alexandria, and Tel Aviv. And get four more civilian factories, nice. Goodbye, San Francisco. Hey, look, money. Not bad. Hey, we're doing even better. Hey, minus 1.9%. Nice. For the past 20 years or so, the passage of the Japanese vessels from the treaty ports out to the sea has taken an almost ritualistic regularity. Upon finishing inventory and final inspection, sailors have been ordered to stay in the bunks during transit. For the first short leg of its journey back to the friendlier waters, each and every Japanese ship has been sneered, farewell by jeers, threats, and obscene gestures from a hostile city. Today, as the last Japanese cruiser finally left the port of San Francisco, this ritual was broken. The jubilant crowds freshly arrived from port parties all over the city, waved and cheered our sailors and found goodbye. The captain of Chico... Chikuma called for all hands on deck to witness the event, and sooner sailors were cheering and waving back. Pictures of the exchange are making the rounds on TV on both sides of the Pacific. A sure sign to people that an era of heightened hostility is coming to a close. Not everyone is equally enthuso, of course. Many in our own country are grumbling about how much ground we are giving to the Americans. We can only hope that the economic benefits of the courts will change their minds as they start trickling out to the population. To the sailors on Chimu Chikuma, and to many watching at home, this feels like start the start of something new. Nice. And we've lost the ports, and we lost a few factories, but that's fine, whatever. That is totally okay for peace in our time for now. Well, maybe not with that saying, but whatever. Operator training, special forces training, very good. Very nice. 0.95 a day, advanced artillery, thank you very much. It's almost 69. We're getting closer and closer. We could do that, but we do that a little bit ahead of time. Whatever. 70, 70, 70, 70, 70, 70, 70, 70, 70. Air doctrine. Heavy aircraft, doing the spy plane still. Light aircraft, we're looking very good. Helicopters, let's grab some improved anti sub, -sub helis. Because we can. Cool. Not bad. We actually were pretty successful so far with the American negotiations. Artillery, bass artillery. What do we have here? Oh, battle for Italy. Support the Front Democratica. Oh, who do we support here? I want to support whoever is leading the party. Oh, Libertarian Socialism in Italy. Oh, 
Okay. Um, I was not expecting this at all. They're libertarian socialists. Ooh, FD, DC. They're 13%. DC, DCD is conservative democracy. Um, I'm not really sure. I guess we'll go with this group. I don't think I'm supposed to be able to support all of them, but... Hey, we'll see what happens. Well, they've invested 75 political power. Holy cow. Their message appears your fears were founded. I will not mince words. Americans want Hawaii. President Richard was polite yet insisted on the matter throughout the visit. He seemed like every other moment in our discussions was punctuated with oblique re references to and, a, and I quote verbatim, the state of affairs in relation to Hawaii's diplomatic status. I imagine the effective advances made as best as possible as one could in my situation, though I can't say the same for the mob that trailed our entourage as we toured D.C. The Gold Eagle lapel pins s several sported made their collusion all too blatant. If I may speak my mind for a brief moment, sir. We underestimate the lengths that the Americans will go to wrest the islands from us. Never mind the Navy starting pride or the diet's gnashing of teeth. Both pale before the conflict or rivals willing to wage over Hawaii. I fear any solution short of session will only shift the burden of preventing nuclear war to our children. Unless, of course, you have a counteroffer in mind. In fact, I do ask him about Panama. We've drawn the line, Minister. They'll go no further. We'll do the counteroffer. Which means not really much to us, but whatever. Cool, and I'll go do supply side fiscal policies. Next, so in this time, as Minister of Finance has formulated a proper methodology for the expansion of the free market and its relation to growth rates and increases in employment. Basically, cutting taxes and regulation allows the free market to produce a greater amount of goods and services for consumers, then the consumers will contribute larger shares of capital to the producers, allowing the producers to expand their businesses and produce more goods and services. It's a cycle of growth, wooden, which Nakasona believes can be accelerated through the aforementioned cutting of taxes and regulations. Takagi, like in all things, is cautious towards what he considers Nakasona's unbridled idealism with regards to the free market and corporation with him. That said, both the Prime Minister and Minister of Finance are sure of their ability to forge a concrete deal, which then will drive forward the government's economic policy. I don't want to lose money. It's only 20%, which is not bad, but still. And actually, we still have minus 44 billion, so the Empire accepts. The Empire agreed, uh, of Japan has agreed to our proposals and terms, and we consented. As we consented, is organizing a conference to discuss demilitarization terms at an unannounced location and unannounced date. Prime Minister Takagi has assured our diplomats that both will be duly communicated within the week, so to allow us ample preparation time. It's also offered his personal congratulations to Prince President Bennett for advancing a diplomatic solution to the Hawaiian question, despite old animosities and new rhetoric from both sides of the Pacific. The President's gamble has paid off, at least for now. America anticipates the culmination of his, of his continued success with bated breath and solemn prayer. He will not be found wanting. Why did we get that event? That's supposed to be for America, isn't it? Hmm. What do we have here? Oh, support for... Oh, yeah, these guys. Regarding the DMZ enforcement, for two about two power rivals, the initial negotiations went surprisingly smoothly. Both parties agreed that the lasting peace necessitated the complete absence of military installations and units, troops, planes, missiles, and ships, and above all, about the Hawaiian Islands and the Panama Canal Zone. Both parties resolved to forbid all military assets from fortifying, basing it, or, or in the case of planes, overflying the aforementioned territories. Both parties also consented to regular inspections by a bipartisan committee, ensuring that agreements letter and spirit are enforced. Where an otherwise ideal negotiation process met with the, with the realities of jockeying with the geopolitical adversary was when the frequency of such inspections were approached. Our diplomats understandably proposed that the committee convene in an annual buy basis. The Americans insisted that they convene once every two years instead, seeing that they sufficiently rigorously in have inspections for two distinct locations requiring more time to conduct a re and, and report than a year lots. The Japanese delegations had responded by questioning the need for inspections lasting longer than a year. The Western adversary's insistence was unperturbed by the dismissal. After several hours of debate and several empty bottles of hard liquor, the conference's attendants finally reached a consensus. Henceforth, a committee consist consisting of selected officials and experts from both countries shall inspect Hawaii and Panama Canal Zone for breaches of terms. For what? We invested 25 annually, biannually. Because we're going to invest more political power. We're currently in the lead. IJN destroyer sunk off Yemen. Oh, that's not good. Oh, crap. Um, take the decision? Sure, why not? The Arab War. Increase special forces deployment? Sure, why not? I got political power to spend. Why not? I'm going to just close this out because we don't need to see it anymore. Since it's bugged as all heck. Can I help anyone here? <laughs> uh, oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Come on, Americans, fold, fold, fold. Military austerity. Oh, yeah, we're going to need to keep doing that for where we're going. Right, so it's so above 400 million. 400 billion, I should say. So I'm going to keep slashing this down. 
Supplies out of fiscal policies? Ooh, that hurts me. The beating heart of the sphere. What has our nation become? We are the masters of Asia, but what have we done with that status? Our resources are extracted elsewhere throughout the sphere. China is our breadbasket and Guangdong is our industrial playground. We used to have these resources and this productive mind to forge a throne of indulgence and hedonism upon the skulls of the conquered and our gunpowder soaked seas. Instead, we should use this might to become a true power, a power which the peoples of the world can gape in all. Unusually for Nakasona, he has enthusiastically supported the idea of a government program being used for the expansion of industry throughout the nation. A warm, ever expanding industrial heart shall be formed in the home isles. Resources shall funnel inwards and be used for the betterment of our position across Asia and beyond. Cut the bloat and replace it with the organs of power. Nice. Oh, and the crisis is maybe. Oh, a missing number. A radar antenna swept the navigation path slowly in the clockwise routine, orderly just as the crewmen expected. Dozens of small dots appeared on the powerful beacon's display. They were about to Japanese ships in the region had been presented to the operators on the screen for several hours as normal, but until one had quietly disappeared. It was early in the morning that hundreds of the crewmen ran their normal routines working in the Japanese Naval Command for the North Pacific. The waters in the region were choppy and icy, unforgiving of the international tension that could not afford the sailors the measure of maritime peace they so desired. Instead, the Japanese had clamped down in the region and made sure that international president would not dare defy the code to... Koku Ta, that had reigned over the Pacific region over two decades. However, intelligence had been made aware of a suddenly missing record on the list of active units of submarines of the Pacific Northeast. They quickly noted and shuffled through the hierarchies of rankings until they met the offices of directors. They had been made aware of a missing submarine and considered its last known location in close proximity to Alaska maritime borders. The facilities were put into high alert. Information being relayed back to the capital and the approval to investigate quickly and was quickly returned. Mr. Fumio was placed as one of the directors commanded to manage the incident, ordered to retrieve the vessel, and demand, defend Tokyo's international prestige from foreign incursion and diplomatic standoff. We have a situation. Oh boy. I apologize for reading really fast. Oh, that hurts. Oh, man, that, that's a lot more hurt than I thought we would get. Oh, we went down by 18%. I thought it was supposed to be 20%, but oh my goodness, submerged to exile. Cool. Mr. Fumio was presented with documents drawn up over the last few decades, or last few hours, I should say. Briefing him about the incident and any further call to action, he scoured the papers at his desk and ran his eyes through the walls of text before placing the sheets back on the desk and exhaling a deep breath. He did not have to read any further to know that this incident had the potential to blow up into a diplomatic standoff with the Americans that the entire world will watch from the TV screens. He twiddled his pen and began to stand up from behind his desk, pleased with the conclusive thought that he could send over to authorities in naval command. Until a singling thought, uh, singeing thought, Thought struck him back to his seat. His moments spent musing about the location of the diplomatic disappearance, the affiliations of the crew members, and the feeble nature of the captain did not consider for once that it could be a mutiny. He clenched his jaw and pinched the bridge of his nose as he was hunched over his desk. Naval command had no choice to confront the fact that a mutiny had likely occurred, and that the crew men were sailing to find refuges exiles in the U.S. Mr. Fumio threw himself back in his chair before leaving out of his office, speeding down the corridors of the naval command with flying papers marked to, marking his trail to inform his superiors of a probable defection. Already pressed for time and resources, a similar realization smothered their faces in a flustered stress as they were enlightened with the threatening news. Their eyes were wide and fierce, and in moments they had sanctioned the deployment of naval units with the task of retrieving the rogue vessel. The most deadly hunt begins. Oh boy. That is not good for anyone. Well, maybe except for the mutineers, but even then. We gotta get rid of them, right? We gotta get rid of these, uh... Mutineers, that would not be very good. It won't end up going well for anyone. We're back in from the east. Captain Nagai, the commander of the I-3 submarine vessel, had been deployed under special orders to divert the course of the missing submarine and place its crew under arrest upon them, bring the vessel to a halt. This, he was a determined man, the son of an IJN veteran who had served the, in the Pacific during the Great East Asia War. He had grown up listening to the myths of the naval skirmishes in the chilling oceans and tales of conflict with the steel American fleets that sit dormant in the east. Now he sat in the control room in a vessel of his own face with a similar threat in the same oceans he was fascinated with as a child. He was, as he was sitting on his throne overseeing the command deck, his musings was interrupted by a transmission from Japanese naval command. They had been made aware of American diplomatic objections to such heavy Japanese naval presence in the region, and the tensions in the already disputed territorial waters have revoked Washington to accuse Tokyo of instigating a skirmish. As information was relayed to Naga Nagai on the crackling transmitter, the chair of his crew slowly dampened until they too were sat in silence, and all the mighty potential Captain Nagai now wielded. Nagai glanced back at his awestruck crew who now looked to him and tested for guidance. The transmitter broadcast was still live, and only the crackle of weak radio connections could be heard on the deck. Captain Nagai, for now sweating, understood that there was a choice to be made. He could pursue the rogue submarine like he was ordered to and risk the lives of not only his men, but countless others in the fallout to come, or he could open a communications channel with the American ships to negotiate an end to the standoff. Images of his childhood tales danced throughout his mind, clouding his vision as he took a deep gulp and clenched his fist. We have orders, gentlemen. Open up lines, the right thing to do. Um... We don't, I really don't want war in this campaign, especially as reformers. I mean, if we were, when we play Japan again someday, and we go like with the more militarist route, or the really the Order 44 route, we'll probably do. We have orders, so we'll get the Hunter's Quarry. I, th I think just for this campaign, it makes more sense for us to do so. Especially as we're trying to reform Japan into a better economy and place. But we'll end this camp. 
not in the campaign, but in the episode of the Triumph of Enterprise. Every man must realize that they must they themselves are an end, not a means to others' ends. We must live for our own sake, not sacrificing others for ourselves, nor allowing ourselves to be sacrificed for others. We must work for our own successes, our own happiness. The achievement of self-fulfillment and the knowledge that our children will not have to suffer as we have is the moral purpose of our lives. We work for our benefit and recognize that others work towards the same goal, although it is not our place to intervene in the self-selection of reality. Nakasone is a part of these ideals upon Japan and is, at least, or at last, satisfied with what he has accomplished. Japan is at long last is ready for the future, the storm of economic globalization for which will rip apart all nations who are yet unprepared. Takagi looks on with hesitation and wonders whether or not Nakasone's predictions are accurate, but there'll be no turning back. The future is coming, and we will bear whatever it holds for us. But that's where we're going to end today's episode, guys. Hope you enjoyed it. If you did, consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below. I apologize that we cannot complete the Dai League investigation because it's bugged. But regardless, have a great rest of your day.